All right, thank you for joining us here today. You're going to hear from Mika Yalava and from me about reproducibility and reusability, reproducibility, words that seem very similar but are also a bit different. And um, what can I say? I think this is a very important issue. And it's great that you found some time to hear about this issue. It's an issue that touches anything in, in research, but not only, of course, in academia or outside academia. As some people say, you know, basically every other result from a paper that you find is not true, it's not replicable. It's actually worse than that. It's maybe 70% are false. But anyway, I will give the stage to Mika. We will start first with the presentation about this concept. And then at the end, I will cover more like specific to the code, replicability, reusability, reproducibility. So if some of you here is coding to get your work done, then we can chat about it also a bit more interactively. The first part of this um, session is uh, presentation only, so you are not able to uh, switch off, switch on your microphone or camera so that you know you're not going to end up in the recording. And then after we are done recording, we will stop recording and you can do whatever you want with microphones and cameras. Thank you, and I pass the word to Mika. Thank you, Enrico. Uh, I'll share my presentation. Okay, good. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mika Jalava. I work as a postdoc at um, a Water and Development Research Group at Aalto University. And uh, our subject today, as Enrico said, is uh, making your research reproducible. So uh, first, I'll give a few words about uh, what reproducibility means and uh, then uh, what deters it and uh, what can we do about reproducibility in our work. Uh, here for starters, uh, I have a picture on the right uh, that is about a rather popular uh, field where uh, people send pictures or uh, present pictures of uh, UFOs, unidentified flying objects. And uh, that's uh, commonly uh, understood as a pseudoscience and for a good reason, because uh, where uh, methods and claims uh, and the proof are not in sync, uh, there's uh, like no way to uh, go for any meaningful research. Of course, um, then UFO pictures like this one, uh, they can be totally reproducible when you understand the method. For example, this one here is uh, simply a gummy bear candy in uh, front of the sun, just slightly out of focus. Gives a nice uh, uh, like visual uh, phenomenon, but uh, simply doesn't have any, any scientific meaning. But uh, yeah, let's, let's go to the uh, subject itself. So uh, what is research reproducibility? So when, when we talk about reproducibility, we uh, basically mean that uh, other people, other uh, research teams can reproduce the results that we have published using the same methods and basically the same data. So that uh, uh, we can say that uh, this is what we did and the others can say that, yes, we understand how you did it. And uh, yes, we can uh, do the same, assuming the same methods and data. Then uh, uh, Enrico said uh, something about repeatability and replicability. Uh, they are similar uh, things. So that uh, uh, with repeatability, we can say that uh, one team can repeat the same analysis with similar results. Uh, that's, of course, especially if you are talking about uh, just code and data and uh, uh, you're running the code over and over again. Uh, typically, not always, but typically you can expect the same results. But on the other hand, if you uh, think about other fields of science, uh, especially uh, where you um, make experiments, that can be much more difficult. And replicability uh, is uh, something that uh, uh, says that other teams can get to the similar results with different methods. That uh, would uh, mean that uh, the phenomenon that we are researching uh, is actually to at least to some extent uh, represented by uh, 
the results and the method that uh, we are using. And uh, all of these have a common goal so that uh, uh, the results that we are publishing, uh, they should uh, represent some measurable phenomenon. Uh, and uh, they should just, shouldn't be just uh, flukes, uh, just by chance you've got the correct result, or they should be unfound, uh, should not be unfounded claims like a UFO picture. So um, uh, let's let's not go too much into details between these different uh, uh, aspects of uh, reproducibility, repeatability, replicability. Uh, so many of the uh, following uh, aspects. Many, many of the following slides, uh, you could say that uh, they are completely uh, valid uh, for any of these. So uh, Enrico mentioned uh, reproducibility crisis, that uh, much of the published science uh, probably isn't exactly as represented. Um, and uh, this question has been studied in itself quite a lot. And uh, in 2016, there was uh, a research study that uh, was uh, published in Nature, uh, where uh, 1,500 scientists uh, answered uh, to questions regarding this crisis. And uh, as uh, you can see uh, from the main result, uh, roughly 90% of uh, the researchers uh, actually said that, yes, there is a crisis, uh, a bit over half said it's a significant crisis and uh, uh, a bit less, less than that uh, said there is a slight crisis, but that's in total 90% uh, agreed that a crisis does exist. But um, this is not necessarily as bad as, as it uh, sounds because uh, only 31% of the uh, uh, researchers said that uh, this means that uh, the results of the research is probably wrong because there is also you you could um, have uh, problems uh, practical problems reproducing uh, results that don't necessarily mean that uh, you did it wrong but it's not just possible to reproduce the work and we'll go into the details like that uh, in in uh, a few minutes so um why is the Repro uh, why is reproducibility so important? Who should care about that? And uh, to answer that, actually, uh, we can look at who needs the results of uh, science and research. So, of course, in, in societies in general, in, in all kinds of industry and even individual people, they do a lot of things that uh, is based on uh, some kind of scientific result, maybe uh, embedded into technology that uh, uh, they're using. But uh, unless the uh, results are uh, actually representing the world as, uh, as we know it, uh, probably these uh, people, they are making wrong decisions and uh, their, their life becomes very, very difficult because uh, they, are, uh, they are expecting something uh, that has been uh, claimed in, in scientific results, but uh, then the real world behaves in a different way. But it's not just the users of uh, applied science. It's actually us in, in science uh, doing, doing research of our own. So um, it's, it's not just credibility, it's not just usefulness, but it's about being able to uh, do science. And uh, on the left, you have uh, a picture uh, representing the, uh, the uh, ancient Greek uh, giant Orion and uh, his servant Sedalion. Uh, Orion was blind and uh, his, his uh, servant Sedalion uh, was uh, acting as his eyes and obviously standing uh, on the shoulder of the giants uh, makes it possible to see further. And that's, that's something that uh, has often been uh, used as uh, uh, like a uh, 
idea uh, that science is actually based on so that uh, we we have to be able to trust that uh, the previous results are right so that uh, we can base our own work on on those and still uh, produce reproducible results ourselves so what is the problem what deters reproducibility so what, what kinds of uh, 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 like roadblocks we have uh, in, in front of us to uh, to reach the reproducibility. So um, there are four main categories that uh, I'm going to be uh, uh, talking about. Or actually, I'm uh, mostly talking about the uh, three first ones here: methods that are not described adequately, or the data that are used for the. Uh, the results uh, are not available. There are good reasons and there are bad reasons for that. Then there are completely st stochastic conditions affecting the uh, results. Uh, and then the last part, which is uh, no, it, it's a bit different from the others because uh, uh, it's about the scientists themselves being uh, dishonest. And uh, that is, uh, slightly different so so i'm not really going that much uh into the details with that uh so um but uh, we can we can talk about that and uh and i think that enrico has one that has has been uh, uh presenting about that that part uh, uh previously uh, would probably be happy to discuss that as well so one by one, those uh, those roadblocks. Uh, so sometimes uh, the method is not adequately uh, represented in the published uh, science paper uh, in the in the published uh, uh, with the published results. And uh, I guess quite a few of you uh, have uh, seen this uh, first line here. Method is adapted from somewhere, and. Uh, then it's it's not enough to know what it's adapted from unless you know how it was adapted from. So if, if the additional steps on top of the method uh, are not uh, exactly described, you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, sometimes also you name the method, uh, like we were using this and this algorithm, uh, but then details are missing. For example, parameters required to run an algorithm or so. Uh, and then, of course, uh, sometimes very complex models are being used, models that have been implemented as computer code. But that code uh, is, is not available, or even uh, as a compiled uh, tool, it's not available. So it's, it's very difficult to know how the implementation actually works, or whether it is uh, adequately uh, described itself. The second uh, part here is about the incomplete data availability. So uh, again, uh, just like before, you have the uh, adapted method. Uh, you might have uh, articles that are referring to data being uh, available somewhere, maybe, but uh, it's not necessarily uh, exactly uh, identified. For example, uh, I have used uh, uh, several uh, databases or, or uh, data repositories uh, that have several versions of uh, some specific data set. And uh, if you say that uh, this, this data set is from uh, this and this uh, uh, repository or database, uh, and you don't tell which version it was, or uh, in, in some cases, even when, when it was accessed, uh, it's impossible to say whether it's the same data or different. Uh, one example that uh, I often like to mention is uh, the uh, uh, United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization's uh, uh, food database, FASTAT. And uh, there, uh, the data are updated uh, when new data arrives. So roughly every three, uh, three years uh, it's updated, but all kinds of uh, errors, mistakes are fixed. 
and uh, and also uh, averages are updated and so on. So you, if you just uh, refer to Fastat uh, uh, and uh, then somebody is trying to run the same code that you used uh, with something that they accessed from that same database, uh, they are probably going to get very different results. Uh, sometimes, even when the data are available, uh, even the exact same data, uh, it's uh, important to understand uh, what kind of uh, pre-processing has been uh, done to the data before it has been uh, used as an input for a specific model or so. For example, you take a huge uh, data set from somewhere and uh, you decide that, okay, the missing data has to be replaced somehow. Maybe you use like averages for missing data. You remove outliers, which may be completely feasible as long as it's exactly described with the process, uh, with the, with the uh, method description. So um, that uh, easily makes uh, uh, reproducing uh, uh, results very difficult unless uh, you can uh, describe or even uh, share the complete process. And then there are uh, very simple little things that uh, may make life very difficult. For example, if you, uh, you just uh, convert formats, for example, let's say uh, you have geospatial data in a certain resolution and you need a different resolution, then uh, just converting rasters between different, uh, different resolutions may end up uh, with different results unless you know which method uh, and which parameters were used. Sometimes there is a problem, and uh, uh, I, I think that uh, we, we can have a, a discussion on this uh, later on, because uh, uh, Enrico is very well aware of the problems uh, with sharing some data, because the data themselves are not public. They cannot be made public because uh, of reasons of uh, the data being personally uh, sensitive. It might be security related nowadays. Uh, security is very much uh, the top of the public discussion and uh, people do understand that not all security related information can be shared. Then there are trade secrets and so on. So, so you should be able to publish results but you cannot publish the data. And then, Obviously, it uh, begs the question whether reproducibility in this kind of situation is a relevant issue at all. And uh, my opinion is that uh, obviously it's, it is uh, very relevant, but then the methods how to achieve reproducibility, how, how can we uh, say that our method is reproducible and uh, you would get the same results regardless of uh, what data you are using. So um, a difficult but important question here. And then it's not simply method or data. It's actually a combination of them that uh, really matters. And uh, I have a citation here uh, or quotation from a, a report uh, from National Academies Press. Uh, that says, when results are produced by complex computational processes using large volumes of data, of course, now we should somehow uh, understand what is a complex computational pro uh, process or how much is much. But anyway, the methods section of a traditional scientific paper is insufficient to convey the necessary information for others to reproduce the results. What does this actually really mean? So um, this report uh, recommends that you provide input, intermediate, and output data, detailed methods. Uh, what is a detailed method? Ideally in an executable format, or I would say even a source code format. And then the third uh, and uh, not 
at all the least important information about the computation environment. So uh, when you are using computer code uh, to process a large amount of data, uh, it's, it's not enough uh, for others to reproduce uh, to explain what you did. Actually, the tools are an important part of reproducible uh, science. And uh, now, what is this computational environment? What do we mean? So uh, the information about computational environment uh, could uh, include things like uh, operating system hardware architecture and library dependencies. But this is a relatively short list. And uh, if, you, if you start explaining things one by one, it probably won't get you very far. So uh, there are things that you wouldn't necessarily even consider a part of a scientific paper, like configuration files, even configuration files of an operating system, something that's like relatively far logically from the actual computer code used in research. Uh, you have uh, often within the uh, models, you have uh, user interfaces, it might be graphical user interfaces that require input from the user. Uh, so you have to provide all that input that was uh, given to select uh, parameters, select uh, algorithms, and so on. Uh, even locales like the language conventions used by the operating system and applications uh, may change how, for example, numbers are interpreted. And uh, I guess uh, everybody that has used, uh, for example, Excel uh, spreadsheet program, uh, it, it was at least uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, it had trouble uh, reading in files with, uh, uh, with different uh, decimal separators. Um, and even, even like uh, function names were in, in different languages, they were different. And uh, it, was, it was not easy to uh, adapt from one language to another. And uh, sometimes you might make it run, but you could get different results. And additional stuff, uh, anything else that can affect the results or how the results are presented. So that's a long list, but uh, it's, it's actually much easier to uh, describe what is enough than uh, what is not enough. And uh, I think that uh, a really good way to achieve reproducible science is, uh, is a complete reference installation of uh, all the software uh, with the input data. Whenever you can, uh, share the input data. Uh, of course, remembering those uh, uh, security, uh, uh, personal identity, and uh, those those uh, issues that might make the uh, data sensitive. Uh, if you can share the data, then uh, putting it together with a real complete installation of configured software with the data, uh, uh, it is easy to uh, give your reader, give, you, give the uh, next scientist or user of your results uh, a chance to simply recreate the whole path from the data to the results. Uh, easy ways of sharing things are uh, very typical uh, is compressed archive. You, you just zip together your programs and, uh, and your uh, data files, but that uh, still leaves uh, much to desire because uh, you still have to install the software and uh, configure it and so on. Then uh, more modern ways uh, like containers uh, could uh, actually uh, include the whole operating system environment with the uh, software and with possibly also the data. And, uh, and a very uh, convenient way to share uh, complete source code for uh, scientific uh, software is uh, version control systems such as Git uh, in, in open repositories. Or if you can't do that, if, for example, the software is uh, not freely available, uh, you really uh, go through a detailed uh, uh, 
the explanation of uh, the uh, software uh, up to the all, all the versions uh, used, uh, how they were used, in which environments, uh, and uh, a very uh, detailed uh, list of data sources. In, remember, including uh, when some data were accessed, where they were accessed, which versions they are. Then again, if possible, uh, intermediate data makes it easier to uh, see that you are on the right path. Uh, installing and using the software and uh, preferably uh, and this is actually really an important part maybe you shouldn't say it's preferably uh, it, it, it's really an important part so that uh, if you do pre-processing uh, for the data uh, you should uh, script that pre-processing so that uh, it's not a list of instructions to a human but it's a list of instructions to a computer that uh, can uh, perform the whole whole script, the whole, whole uh, method for, uh, up to running the model. Okay, so um, the third part really uh, was about random effects. And uh, what I mean by random effects is that uh, some, some studies uh, that, especially those that uh, require experiments, uh, they really can't be even expected to give exactly the same results when you uh, perform the uh, experiments again, like medical sciences, where you test new medicines, uh, you give them uh, to a certain number of uh, patients, and uh, maybe some heal, some don't, and then you do it again, uh, you have different numbers, and, and we expect that. In social sciences, you, you might make uh, a questionnaire, and uh, you interview people, and obviously people are different, and you get different results. But still, uh, that is something that we expect. Physics may sound a little bit more like uh, an exact science, but we have to remember that, uh, for example, things like uh, quantum mechanics—they are inherently uh, well, like probability-based. So you do get different results. Of course, when you uh, perform the experiments uh, enough times, uh, you get probability distributions. And uh, that's what you expect. You, you expect to get similar or same probability uh, uh, distributions, not exactly same string of results. And these just have to be understood. So uh, what you expect to reproduce is probabilities and uh, you not, not uh, the same results over and over again. But on the other hand, uh, even when you have uh, open source code, you have fixed data, you have a, a data uh, repository where you fetch the exact same uh, representation of data and you run the same code again, you might get different results. Uh, that might be because uh, you use uh, sto uh, stochastic sampling. Uh, you train an artificial intelligent model or an uh, intelligence model and so on. So we really have to understand what we are trying to reproduce here. And uh, if we want to be able to uh, reproduce the exact path that was taken uh, within uh, the published research, uh, then we have to uh, provide something like uh, uh, random number seeds and uh, things like that. So uh, even computers uh, may not produce the same results over and over again when we tell them not to. That's, that's important. We, it's, it's important to be able to uh, break the pattern, so to say. Then if we look at the uh, human side of the crisis, this is actually how those, those previous uh, uh, three issues, really, they are, they are inherent to how research is done, what should be done and uh, what should be published and how it should be published. But why do we still uh, end up with a crisis? We, we have known this, uh, that uh, all those uh, issues should have been taken into account, but we still have uh, and might actually have an uh, 
have a like a worsening situation with reproducibility reproducibility and uh, the reason is that it's it's not really so to say it's not free because uh, uh, publishing data uh, and publishing uh, papers uh, is it is academic credit that's that's what you have to do to get academic credit but uh, typically it's uh, calculated uh, in simple numbers how much not really that much about uh, quality of course there is there are uh, uh, ways to uh, measure the credibility of the journals and so on but but really the the quantity is still uh, preferred quite a lot and uh, the really big part of the uh, issue is that it's um, data and code, they, are, they haven't been considered part of that scientific credit so far. And uh, that, that side is improving, but still, uh, if you compare publishing uh, a research paper and publishing your data in a data repository, it's it's much more important to get that paper out. Maybe start working on the next paper. Maybe you shouldn't publish your uh, data so that you you can uh, uh, create a new paper before somebody else uses your data to uh, to uh, reach some to reach a goal before you. So this this side is improving though. So so that uh, the data repositories and uh, publishing data is appreciated more and more all the time. Then uh, a really important part is people are lacking programming skills. So that, uh, uh, for example, when uh, you, you perform uh, preliminary steps, those like data pre-processing, uh, still many people prefer uh, using a spreadsheet or, or somehow uh, fiddling with the data uh, manually and not uh, methodically uh, writing program code, or writing scripts to do that. Uh, and uh, very closely connected with that, uh, there is the sharing anxiety. So that uh, if you have lacking programming skills, then even if you do script your uh, data processing, uh, you could be uncertain about sharing your program code. Is, is this good enough? You know, or is this just uh, uh, decreasing the credibility of uh, my work rather than increasing it? So uh, these are things that uh, we should really consider in, in education and uh, in, the, in the daily work of researchers so that we could support them uh, with these issues so that they are not alone and are not just suffering from the results and, uh, and that the quality of the research uh, is suffering from the results of these these issues. So, um, okay. But you can't always just blame the authors. I said, why is it difficult to publish stuff? Why uh, uh, why don't people just simply uh, do the right thing? But um, it's it's there is also a kind of a, a threshold for reproduction in a way. So it's not always just the uh, fault of the researchers not telling others enough. Uh, if you think about uh, another research team trying to uh, reproduce what we have done, uh, first of all, you have to expect them to be experts in the field. So that uh, we are doing difficult things. And, uh, and obviously, if, if, you, if we talk about uh, experiments, if uh, CERN is uh, running their uh, uh, Large Hadron Collider, it's not feasible to expect somebody else to build a similar machine. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, even just uh, from the logical side of it, uh, you have to expect that uh, people reproducing your work understand what you have done. Uh, they also uh, need to use all the material that has been provided. Sometimes uh, it is uh, quite obvious that uh, problems with reprodu uh, reproducibility have been reported uh, without actually uh, going through all the available materials. So then you have to understand the method 
and uh, you have to know where to uh, get the actual data and tools. And then when you have all this, you are the uh, knowledgeable expert. You have uh, understood what has been done. You have the tools that you need. Then you only need to work. Uh, maybe it is, it is going to require a lot of uh, hard work and money. But uh, notice what's missing from this uh, picture. So um, you should not be expected to contact the original author. Uh, you should not be expected to have supernatural capabilities. These are connected in a way. If, uh, if for example, the uh, original author has deceased, uh, well, you can't contact them. So, so this is a reason why the, uh, the research uh, should be published in a way that uh, promotes reproducibility. It is not possible to contact all the authors of uh, existing uh, historical uh, research. And obviously, you don't have access to hidden information. Okay, so what can we do about this? So uh, what, what to do to get uh, uh, kind of uh, over those uh, roadblocks? Uh, there are several good uh, resources. Uh, we have a new uh, page for getting started with uh, the uh, reproducibility work. And uh, we have uh, several, or, or there are several uh, pro projects and recommendations that uh, have been published on reproducibility. And uh, I, I warmly recommend these, uh, these PDFs. Uh, we have um, uh, like the, the uh, more and more common requirement by uh, funders and uh, the, the goals of universities are uh, in favor of open publishing of um, articles, code, and data. But as described previously, it's not enough. So that uh, it, it's not just a, a formal step-by-step uh, -step process. You have to understand what you are doing. And uh, it starts from uh, data management planning so that uh, you know what you have. Uh, you store it in a way that uh, makes it uh, usable, accessible, and uh, that uh, promotes uh, uh, like a, a reproducibility at the later stages of your research work. Uh, then the end-to-end -end scripting, that uh, is the important part of uh, doing the uh, analyses. And also remember uh, the preliminary parts like uh, data pre-processing. Uh, in a repeatable way. And uh, then I would say that uh, one, one part that uh, is important to uh, kind of overcome those problems that researchers have with uh, sharing their code and uh, results so that uh, to be able to uh, be confident with their programming skills, I think uh, one important part is uh, like trying to understand programming only as a part of software engineering so that uh, uh, you, you're not just simply writing code and then giving that away. You, you should actually uh, take care that uh, just like data, uh, you have a management plan for your data. Uh, so for your code, uh, you should use version control. You should understand which version of your code was uh, used to publish uh, your work and uh, which version uh, does what. and uh, and also another part is testing your code so that uh, when, when you make changes, you understand that uh, you are getting the uh, scientifically sound results uh, every time. So, uh, but that is a whole uh, other uh, subject for a long, long presentation. So let's not go too much into the details, but I think you should uh, probably uh, uh, search around for uh, what, what is, understood by software engineering versus uh, computer programming. And at the end, uh, a kind of practical short take home message. So uh, be systematic with your work so that uh, 
uh, when you describe your data sources, uh, that is understood by the reader in a way that uh, eventually uh, results in the correct information being retrieved. So uh, document your method. And uh, here often uh, the method section of uh, a scientific article is, is not going to be uh, enough. So uh, there are ways to kind of uh, script a method so that uh, you can, you can uh, combine a number of steps uh, in a computerized uh, uh, data analysis uh, into a kind of complete script that uh, performs steps in, in different pieces of uh, software code. And uh, another part, uh, uh, understand what you are sharing. So uh, is it usable as is? And uh, typically I would say that uh, a researcher, him or herself, uh, is typically very, very optimistic about the usability. So do you think that uh, when you share a file uh, with, let's say, some uh, data, some parameters, uh, is it obvious from that uh, file what do these uh, fields mean? And uh, is the data enough? Is, do you need some external information? Remember that uh, you don't, you're not expected to have access to hidden information. So what you share is all that the reader has. And the documentation of your work, uh, both in uh, scientific publications and also wherever you publish the data, if it's in a separate repository or if it is a supplementary information package. Just make, it sh make sure that uh, the methods and data uh, match together so that uh, whatever uh, code you have uh, reads in exactly the data that you provide. And uh, typically the thing to ensure this is make the code and the environment uh, available so you can be sure that it's, it's usable as is. Okay, so um, this is uh, the presentation I had, but uh, now we have uh, time for, uh, actually we have pretty good time for our discussion.